Hi, my name's Rosemary Manners and I'd like to welcome you tonight for, um, for the talk on children and brain chemistry. Now, what's happening out there? Good question. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a childhood epidemic going on, which is, which is what we're all here to talk about. ADHD affects 1 in 10 um, children, um, school age kids. Autism in Australia has been diagnosed 1 in 91. Obesity, 25% in Australia and New Zealand. And asthma and eczema have increased fivefold in the last 40 years. So what's happening? Why is this happening? And to look at why this is happening, we want to have a look at the GBI axis. So GBI stands for gut, brain and immune. And I like super highways. Um, and so gut affects brain, brain affects immune, immune affects gut. And with these super highways, it's like three lanes going one way and three lanes going, going the other. So they're forever interplaying back and forth for each of them. So let's look at each of them individually. So the gut and brain pathways. So we've got neuropathways from our brain that regulate our digestive function. It goes through the nerves um, which release neurotransmitters. So if I have poor sleep or anxiety or depression, um, it makes a difference to the digestive function. I see it all the time. We get customers coming in with IBS and if you talk to somebody with an irritable bowel syndrome, they'll always tell you that it, they have episodes when, it's when they're stressed or there's something huge happening in their life. The other way around, yes, what's happening in the gut affects the brain. One of the ways it affects it is um, chemicals and pesticides increase the cytokinins, the cytokinins drift into the brain um, and it has a direct effect on what, what's the children's developing um, central nervous system. Uh, with clinical studies to back this up, um, leaky gut leads to inflammation and depression. Um, and that was presented at International Congress of Natural Medicine in 2009. The other, th the other, the next thing we want to look at is gut and immune. How does that affect each other? So we already know that 70% of the immune system is located in the walls of the gut. So they're sort of like Siamese twins working together. The immune cells um, are largely governed by exactly what bacteria is in the gut and also um, by the by the integrity of the gut lining. Um, and the other side of the gut lining, so if the immune system um, creates too many of these inflammatory cytokines or inflammatory molecules, that can have an effect on the gut lining and make it a little bit more porous than it was already. So you can see these highways, like, like a highway, that one affects the other and the other one and then conversely the other comes back and affects the other. So they all work together. The immune system affects the brain. So we all know that when you get stressed at work and around tax time I always saw more cold and flu tablets. Um, it was funny, I was looking for, at some figures from the GFC um, and so they map it in a world scale and it was at one of the conferences I went to and where the GFC came, came out with health there was this huge increase of sort of unhealth, I guess, um, with the GFC that came back down. So it was like a bell curve over these big sort of stressful events and that's happening on a worldwide um, basis. So you can see back into your normal life, if you're stressed, it, it affects your immune system. Inflammatory mediators can also go in and affect the blood-brain barrier and we will find out that a lot of those inflammatory mediators are actually live in the brain and actually work along there with, alongside our brain cells. So we're, that's, they all work really sort of um, together. But the interesting thing is, um, what's our body's protection? So we've got the, um, the gut, the brain, and the um, immune system working together. When they don't work, how, what protects us? And that's what we talk about, um, oxidative stress. And especially in children, it's glutathione is the antioxidant that does the most action. So um, this is a study, due to the lack of glutathione producing capacities by neurons, the brain has a limited capacity to detox reactive oxygen species. Therefore, neurons are the first cells to be affected by the increase in ROS. And a shortage of antioxidants, as a, as a result, are the most susceptible to oxidative stress. So if I'm a little bit low on glutathione, or my glutathione gets used up very quickly, that's where I'm going to see the most reaction in the brain. Um, this next study is, is actually looking at um, schizophrenia. It was a study done with schizophrenia, but again, glutathione was brought up as the brain's um, protection in children, and there was the results of the trial 
um, indicated that if there wasn't enough glutathione, then you'd have more nervous system um, symptoms or more um, central nervous system symptoms. Uh, there's another study um, about poor glutathione status in autism. There seems to be a general trend in autism that um, the kids tend to have less glutathione, so less protection uh, for this exposed brain. So the answer is not very high, eat your broccoli. So cruciferous vegetables are what helps, um, that helps create glutathione. So cauliflower, cabbage, garden cress, bok choy, broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts. I know my nephew used to always call them little trees, but it's the little trees that make the big difference. Turmeric's another thing. If you can, um, if you can come up with some recipes with curry, if your kids love curry, that's another protection and it helps your body create more glutathione. Okay, so we've got this um, brain, immune and gut and they work as they work together as one interacting with each other. So when they get out of kilter and when the problems happen, what are we going to do? Like what, what tools have we got? Because that's what we're here for tonight, isn't it? To work out the tools. So natural health comes to the rescue. So there's six ways that we can work on to make a direct difference with, with kids and brain chemistry. So the first one is uh, micronutrient deficiencies. So making sure that we've got all the ingredients to the cake. So making sure that we've got all the micronutrients that our brain needs to function. Um, diet is really important. It plays a huge, um, a huge role in behavior is what's in the eating plan. Dysbiosis. So dysbiosis is the gut bacteria. So an adult will have four kilos of bacteria in the gut. A child will have a lesser amount depending on how old they are, but it's a really sort of big colony there. We've also got bacteria up our nose and our ears, all over our skin, throughout our hair. Like there's bacteria. In fact, the scientists are now saying that we're more bacteria than we are human cells. My human cells are 10% and my bacteria is 90%. So it's a, got, got a really big um, effect on how my health is, is what my gut bacteria to, are doing or not doing for that matter. Um, leaky gut. So if my gut is not performing uh, particularly well and I get these big macro molecules sneaking through there, that's going to make a difference. Impaired gut toxicity. So as a child, we don't have as they don't have as sort of as much um, protection as an adult, as much ability to detox. Um, so, but we want to ramp it up as much as we can because if we can get rid of more stuff in the body, then the body will function. That shouldn't be, then the body will function a little bit better. And heavy metal exposure. They now say that the polar bears in the um, Arctic and up in Iceland have organophosphates in them. So we've all got heavy metal exposure. But if we can bring that down and minimise as much as possible, it's going to um, help help our children. So let's go through those one by one. So micronutrient deficiency. So we want to optimise our daily dietary micronutrients intake with a nutritional supplement. Um, this just fills up all the bits and pieces because we don't know, you might be eating your best broccoli, your best proteins, getting some really good fats, but what's to say that the oil, that the soil's got the micronutrients in you're looking, looking, looking for? So we just want to be able to tick off that your brain can function really well because it's got every micronutrient that it needs. And there's some backup evidence for this. Iodine suppl supplementation improves cognition function. So if I didn't have enough iodine, um, I would expect like from this study that maybe I might sort of um, not be able to understand and be able to uh, read as well as somebody that did have uh, and understand as well as somebody that did have iodine. So I definitely want some iodine. This one's all about magnesium and how um, low serum magnesium levels in ADHA are correlated with more symptoms. I think that doesn't have to be that like they study, they study the kids with diseases but that wouldn't be the same that would sort of be the same with kids that weren't diagnosed with ADHD. They tend to, magnesium is one of those key elements. And if you don't have enough, you're going to um, have low concentration. You might have muscle cramps. You might have pain. There's going to be obvious signs. So I think it's really important that we, we can tick off all those macronutrients and make sure that like we've got the ingredients to have a healthy body in the first place. The next thing I want to look at is your eating pattern, your diet. And what I'd like to start with is what we don't want. So we don't want to be low in phytochemicals. So, okay, we've got the supplement. We're getting a whole lot of good nutrients from that. 
But that's not enough. We need to get a whole lot more. And mainly we get that from our vegetables and fruit. So we want a diet that's really high in vegetables and fruit so that we know that we're getting the phytochemicals that we need. We also, there's a tendency with kids to eat more carbohydrates, less protein, less fats. Well, I'm a, I love the balanced diet. So I love, um, I love um, things to, well, I love things to be balanced. So high carbohydrates, high sugars will not only affect the gut flora, but it will also affect my, um, my health, health altogether. Um, excessive consumption of additives, flavors, and or colors. We'll have a look at that in just a moment. Um, but we don't want all those things. They make, there's a lot of studies out there. I'll show you one, but they really do make a difference to the behavior of kids. And you can see it quite, um, I know when you have the parties and you hand out all the red lollies, you see some kids that nearly sort of jump through the roof on those things. And high antigenic foods. So we don't want any foods in there that are just going to that fire up the inflama inflammation pathways. So when we look at additives, flavors, and calories, we have found that they interact with the dopamine pathways. Um, so they've been found to inhibit the dopamine uptake and increase the release of acetylcholine in neuromuscular synapses. So that's particularly important because what we've found when they do drill down and work out with hyperactivity for children, they're actually looking at dopamine and looking at dopamine really carefully because they think that the hyperactivity has got to do with the specifically with the dopamine pathways. So if we're taking things that are going to inhibit um, that dopamine pathway, that's not going to head in the right direction. Um, and that's all really good saying, oh yes, I'm not going to have additive flavors and coloring, but they hide them. <clears throat> Often when I'm looking at the back of things, they don't say, oh, I've got something that's got additives or flavor and it's going to make your children sick. It's going to have these magic numbers. So you need to know the numbers. So here's a, here's a list of your numbers so that you can really know that if something has a number on it, um, what it is, and it's really important to know what it is and whether it's going to affect your children's um, welfare and behavior. So what I love most is a balanced, unprocessed diet. And I start that I start that off with everybody, whether they're kids or adults, is sort of really getting the protein, the carbohydrates, and the fats balanced, and looking at each category and picking the picking the best out of each category. Um, so we want most of most of the carbohydrates. We want them all fruit and vegetables. We want some really good protein to build muscle muscle mass to get enough energy, and we want fats. Like we're made up of trillions and trillions of cells, and every cell is surrounded by a lipid a lipid um, membrane and that lipid membrane comes with fats so when our cells are not going to be really strong if we don't have enough good fats in our diets. More dietary ideas if we're finding that just a balanced diet is not enough to um, make big changes in health. Um, we've got a whole selection of diets that we choose from. We have a wellness diet, we have a gluten-free diet, we look at carbohydrates, um, we look at salicylates, we can look at an elimination diet, an anti-candida diet, we've got um, hyperglycemic diet, we're looking at FODMAP diets. Like you've got to work that out on a one-to-one one -one basis, but don't feel like, oh, I've tried a healthy diet, that's not the answer. There's more out there and, and keep on looking until you find the right answer. So diet to me is a really key element in getting that diet right. And if it doesn't work the first time, well, try something different the next time. Um, kids are really used to routine. If you suddenly go home and say, oh, right, we're going to go for a whole food diet and you serve completely different food, I'd expect the kids to say, well, I don't know whether I'm really up for that. So it's a matter of introducing it slowly, getting them to try new foods. Like if I hand, hand my kids, if I said, do you want an apple or cream bun? Of course they're going to try the cream bun. But... If I offer them the apple and they say, oh, no, I don't feel like it, kids never starve themselves to death. So they're going to be hungry a bit later on and they'll come back for the apple. Like it's there. And, and the thing is, it's training the kids and explaining to the kids and making it fun. Let's have some trees for dinner. Let's have some, some things that look like your eyeball. Like I love the signature of food with kids because you look at a food and imagine what part of the body that it's going to be really good for. So you grab the carrot and you can see it's really good for the eyes. You can look at the chambers in a tomato and think, oh, well, that's going to help my heart. We can look at different fruit and vegetables and we can, we can look at the part of the body it's really going to help. And then it sort of inspires them to eat that food. Make it fun. Like kids love fun and making food fun is really gets them inspired to sort of eat, eat what Eat something that's really going to help their brain grow. So we've
talked about dietary things. The next thing I want to talk about, I've called it zoo, which is the dysbiosis. So all that bacteria in your gut, we want it to be as, as healthy bacteria as we possibly can. So we've got dysbiosis has been positively correlated with poor um, metal clearance in kids. There's studies that if you've got healthy gut flora, we're more able to get through, get rid of heavy metals that are coming in. Um, that colony is right in the centre of our body, so it's really important um, that it's the most healthiest colony it can possibly be. Um, things in our like we get our colony from our mothers, like when we're in our mother's tummy, we get another dose um, when we have a vaginal birth and another dose from breast milk. From then it's up to us to look after our colony as a child. Sometimes we have antibiotics that will sort of hit it on the, hit it off in the wrong direction. Um, sugars might sort of fire up the baddies, but we're, the, the microbiome colony is, is is always replicating it's always moving in one direction or another so we want to ensure it is it's because it's the centerpiece of the body is to be as healthy as possibly can so we do testing here in the clinic if we if we don't sort of have enough testing here we can send it off to pathology labs but we're really interested um in in what that what that zoo what that dysbiosis what what sort of level of dysbiosis do you have and what that probiotic that centerpiece of the body and how it's contributing to your health the next thing that's really interesting that we can work on is the leaky gut. So there's thought that, um, well it's not exactly like that bucket, you can see those big holes coming out of the bucket, but it's thought that the wrong bacteria or eating foods that's reactive, um, that you might have an intolerance for that create inflammation, or there might be something else going on in your body that creates inflammation, also creates little minuscule sort of holes in the gut wall. What happens is these little bit still at a micro sort of size but these little these little still little molecules but they're a little bit bigger than it would normally through start leaking through the gut wall well you remember the the immune systems in the gut wall so the immune system starts getting hyper reactive starts reacting and reacting some more um, it produces inflammatory inflammatory products so it's, we call them cytokines to try and mop up all this so all this sort of leaking food which as if it's an invasion and in an adult you can see it because you see the cholesterol levels going up so as much as we possibly can we want to heal that gut we just want we just want the nutrition coming through that wall we don't want any macromolecules that shouldn't that the body doesn't know what to deal with so as much as we can in the clinic we'll use either foods or we'll use supplements to try and heal that wall as much as we possibly can uh, we already know that kids have I mean, impaired uh, detox capacity compared to an adult. Like when you're born, you don't have a fully developed immune system. Your gut's not fully developed and your brain's still developing. So we haven't really sort of got it. We're, we're developing as we're growing. But as much as possible, if we've got well, toxins or things that shouldn't be in your system, we want to be able to get rid of them as much as we possibly can so that our body can return to a... Um, a place where it can function. Those super wide highways are not clogged up with dirt or anything and broken down traffic that they can they can flow just very smoothly. Now um, heavy metal exposure is such a big thing especially with all these all these um, behavioral things in children. So that you found they found organic phosphates in polar bears. You can imagine what we've got in in our own bodies. Like it's not it's not a thought that we don't have any. We just want to be able to get rid of as much as we possibly can. We already know that children absorb more lead than adults. We know that young children um, distribute heavy metals into the soft tissues rather than bone. An immature blood-brain barrier allows increased CNS penetration. So not only are we, we've got these heavy metals around, but they start sort of getting into that brain. And that's when they make the sort of real big impact on my behaviour. Um, so we're, we're more susceptible at every level as a child. So we want to do as much as we can to clean up those heavy metals. So I can run around and I think it's really good running around drinking green drinks and getting um, and having organic food. But it doesn't have very much research down any of our food sources. All the air that we drink, all the the air that we breathe or the water that we drink to know it's not as clean as we'd like it to be. So in the clinic we test for heavy metals if it's a problem or if we expect it to be a problem we send off pathology down to Victoria that sometimes even goes to the states for double checking but we want to know if there's something there and if there is something there we want to be able to pull it out. So and there's
a lot of research at the moment saying, well, what's an okay level? And there's a lot, been a lot of research to say what gross levels, like for, I'm going to say for lead. So we know what happens lead poisoning. And we know what happens when it's sort of very low, but there's a not a lot of information on how high is dangerous. So this study has come back, so, so even low um, blood levels of um, lead will still generate um, ADH-like symptoms. So like the, you might not be diagnosed with ADH, ADHD, but you'll have symptoms that might be like it. And you can see the different um, studies, they sort of disagree with exactly how much, um, how much that will affect and what is a safe level. We've, we've looked at the story, we've looked at the GBA access, which is your gut, your brain and your immune. We've looked at lots of things that we can, um, we can do. We've looked at six things that we can do to help, help that GBI access and support it in young kids with the thought of being able to sort of get that brain chemistry firing as it should be. The next part of the story is inflammation, is neurological inflammation. So what we've said so far is if I've got a leaky gut and bits and pieces are leaking in the system, then it's my body's inflammation. What happens is the body um, creates an inflammation. So we found also inflammatory cytokine is 11 times higher in autistic brains. So we know that inflammation is not helping our kids. So the inflammation happens. That inflammation actually makes the leaky, the blood brain barrier more leaky. So the next bit of the story is the micro microglial activation. So this is really new. This is really new information. And it's like there's a fire going on. There's a fire in the brain. And you see this in kids. Like I have these kids in and it's like they can't they can't sit still. And they're off and they some of them are twitching and, and running around and where's the calm? <laughs> like there's no calm. It's like those heads are like are on fire. So one of the thoughts out there or one of, where the research is going into this Michael a microglial activation and they're really cool. I've got a picture here, have a look at the picture. So the microglia are these little greeny little bits. They're part of the immune system. I remember at school I used to be always told we only use 10% of our brain. Well it's true, that's all the scientists knew that was there. But these microglia are thought now to, to be the other 90% or the other big part of it. And what they do is they wrap around the nerve cells and my best explanation is being like the party, the party gossipers. So you know those times where you go to a party and and you might walk in and say, oh, did you know that Joan bought a new house? And the gossipers take that bit of information, it goes around, somebody says there's a big house of Joan, and by the time you're leaving party, Joan's bought a six-story house and bought clothes. Well, that's the microglions. They get a bit of information, they upregulate, they get excited, they pass it on to something else, and you get this whole drivers of microglial activation. This is where the damage is done. So it's no surprise that the drivers of microglial activation is that list that we've already been talking about. So it's heavy metals, inflammation, gluten intolerances, vitamin D deficiency, low essential fatty acids, food allergies, candida overgrowth, oxidative stress. We've seen this list before, but by, by treating this list and by bringing down that list to being a very, very small list, you'll find, you find that the brain chemistry comes back to normal, the glial activation, um, the glial activation simmers down and that brain chemistry has all the chance in the world to work so much better. Okay, so the game changers. What we've learned today is we want to treat the micronutrient deficiencies. We want to improve the diet. We got, want to get rid of that bad bacteria that's living in the gut that's not helping us at all. We want to repair leaky gut. We want to enhance detox capacity. And we want to minimise heavy metal exposure and be able to pull as much heavy metal out if, if it is a problem. Like we want to check it and make sure it is a problem problem. So in our clinic we've got ways of checking mo checking these things. We've um, got a test that looks for dysbiosis. Um, we have a heavy metal screening test. Uh, we also have um, pathology labs. There's some fantastic pathology labs. There's new tests out there to do. The MTRF, the pyrols. We've got a brand new um, lab that's offering um, 
offering tests on the different neurotransmitters to find out sort of what they're doing and bringing that in line. So being able to sort of really sort of um, target exactly what the imbalance is. This is the course we run on a course called Clean Within for Kids. And the idea of the course is to have a look at the drivers, work out what your drivers are, and then work at sort of correcting them slowly over time.